Uh, good evening. Thanks for thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Um, our speaker is Dr. Jarvis J. Williams. Uh, he served as an associate professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern Seminary since 2013. He's published numerous academic works. A few are Maccabean martyr traditions in Paul's theology of atonement. Did martyr theology shape Paul's conception of Jesus' death? For whom did Christ die? The extent of the atonement in Paul's theology and Christ died for our sins. Representation and substitution in Romans in their Jewish martyrological background. I'm sure I did not say that right. He's published essays on soteriology in Romans and in Second Temple Judaism in Brill Academic and in the Society of Biblical Literature Press. He's also published numerous popular books and articles on racism and racial reconciliation. Fine, I'll use it. <laughs> Williams' research focuses on soteriology, broadly defined in Second Temple Judaism, the Second Temple Jewish context of Paul's soteriology in Romans and Galatians, and the intersection of soteriology and race. His many current writing projects include a Galatians commentary for the New Covenant commentary series and a TNT Clark monograph on one verse in the Bible, Galatians 3.13, an entire book on that one verse, for the Library of New Testament Studies series. He's interested in supervising PhD students pursuing specialization in the Second Temple Jewish context of Paul's soteriology in Galatians. He's also a member of the Society of Biblical Literature. Let me tell you real fast why I invited him. I read a bunch of his stuff online years ago, and it was provocative in the following way. It seemed to me that it would probably annoy everybody, <laughs> left, right, center. And so because of that, I thought to myself, I'll bet you this is as close to the truth as we'll get. So please welcome Dr. Jarvis Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you for, com for coming to this lecture on a Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So very thankful for your attendance. Let me just say a word of thanks to Drs. Alexander and Benjamin for inviting me. It is a privilege and an honor to share with you tonight uh, on a topic that I spent a lot of time thinking about, and I'm going to work from my outline that I passed out to you. What I'm going to say uh, tonight is right in front of you. Most of it is. So I encourage you to sit back and enjoy the ride, and there will be times when the ride gets a little bit bumpy, but I'll try to make it less bumpy. Uh, I am a scholar, but I'm also a preacher, and I'm a Baptist preacher, so I'll probably get loud a few times, spit a little bit, and bang the podium a couple times, all right? But I want to encourage you to think critically about what I'm saying, and don't receive anything that I say as, as gospel truth until you check it with the text of Scripture, amen? So think very critically as I'm lecturing on this material, and Lord willing, and he's not always willing, but Lord willing, I'll talk only for about 35 minutes and let you spend the rest of the time grilling me with some difficult questions. Let me read this passage of Scripture to you, first of all, from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, or 6 through 10, and then I want to say a word of prayer and then dive into the lecture, okay? And by the way, this is a lecturer to whom... Uh, you can speak as I'm talking, all right? So if I ask you a question, you can talk back to me, all right? A little, a little call and response tonight. Can we get a little call, call and response? Yeah. All right. Galatians 5, or Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Hear the Word of God. I want you to hear this text. This is where I'm going to spend most of my time talking tonight. Romans 5. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us like this. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died 
for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Let's ask God to help us as we think about this topic. Christ died for our sins. Representation and substitution in Romans. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pray tonight that you would invade this place by the power of your Spirit. That you would awaken our hearts to the truth of the Gospel. That Jesus Christ invaded this present evil age took on a life like ours, participated in a life like ours, and died on the cross and absorbed your wrath so that we would be saved from judgment. And Father, maybe even as I say that, that terrifies some people. To think about a wrathful God and a Jesus who bears that wrath. But Father, we pray tonight that you would help us to hear what your word says and to respond to it as Christians in faith. I pray for these students that you'd help them to think critically about what they hear and that you would help them to respond to the truth therein with the hope of the gospel, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. Let's dive in. Let me set my water down. I'm working right from your handout. Tonight I want to talk about representation and substitution in Romans. First, I want to define my categories. By representation, I mean the following. Jesus represents the sinner in life and in death. To state it another way, God the Son became a functional sinner. Now let that sit with you for a moment. Jesus Christ entered this world as a man. As the old song says, he came from heaven to earth, right? To show us the way. He became a real human being. He did not appear to be a man. He was a real man. He was the God-man. God did not become, hear this carefully, God the Son did not become a God. God the Son became a Jewish man. You understand the difference? Do you understand the difference? And when he became a man, he functioned in this world as a sinner. But he wasn't ontologically a sinner, which means... He was without sin. He did not commit sin. But he became a human being. When he became a human being, he placed himself under the power of sin, under the curse of the law. But here's the difference between him and us. He broke the power of sin by perfectly obeying God's law, dying on the cross, and resurrecting from the dead. But here's the basic point. He represents us as a real man who functioned in the real world as a sinner, operating under the restraints of a human being as the God-man. Does that make sense? Let me give you some text. So I'm going to give you a premise, and I'm going to give you some verses, all right? So a few passages. And I hope you brought a Bible to a lecture about the Bible. If you didn't, shame on you! First text, Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. Now, I know this is not Romans, but Galatians has something to say about this definition. Hear what Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, which I think captures my point. Then I'll go back to Romans. Galatians chapter 4, pick it up in verse 4, first of all. Paul says, but when the fullness, hear it carefully, when the fullness of time came, 
God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Okay, stop right there. Remember my definition. Jesus represents us. He became a man. He functioned as a sinner. He was not a sinner, but he functioned like one. He lived in a real human body. He was born of a real woman. Yes, without sin. But he lived in the real world under what? Under the law. And in Galatians, to be under the law means to be under a curse. To be under slavery. To be under the present evil age. Verse 5. Paul says, here's why he was born, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. Romans 5, I think, captures it as well. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is making the argument in verses 12 and following regarding the salvation that Jesus brought. And in Romans chapter 5, he says something very important about my definition of representation. Here's what he says. He says in chapter 5, verse 12, Just as, hear this carefully, therefore just as, Romans 5, 12, through one man, sin entered into the world. Who's that one man? Yes. And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Now notice verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Okay, now now watch this. Paul identifies Jesus as a type of Adam. Jesus is the new Adam, if you will. And Adam was a, in my view, Adam was a real man who lived in history, but who represented other people, namely all humanity. So when Adam sinned, what does Paul say? Everyone sins in Adam, and we sin personally, Romans 3, verse 23, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Death entered the world, sin entered the world through one man, namely Adam. Adam was representing us, and Jesus is the new Adam who enters into our plight as a human being to represent the new Adam, and he dies on the cross and resurrects from the dead as our representative on earth. Does that make sense? He represents us. So what does that mean for me at 7 o'clock on a Thursday night? Well, notice back on your outline. As our representative, Jesus participates in a life like ours. That is, he becomes a human being so that we would participate in a life like his by faith. That is, we experience resurrection life. Let me state it another way. The Son of God becomes the God-man as he invades the world as the second Adam. So that we, the first Adam's children, would participate in resurrection life. Jesus represents us. Let me say it this way. He becomes one of us. Say it the way Galatians says it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Paul, how does he redeem us from the curse of the law? By becoming a curse for us. Now, here's a question for you. Did Jesus disobey God's law? It's not a rhetorical question, did he? Let me say it this way. Did he sin? No. Well, there's a problem. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, For as many are from works of the law are under a curse. And many scholars argue the reason they are under a curse is because they cannot, those who 
receive the law of God, cannot obey the law of God to save themselves from that curse, is what some argue. So if Jesus perfectly obeyed God's law, how does he redeem us from it by becoming a curse by it? You follow what I'm asking? Galatians 3.13, he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. Here's how. Here's how the perfect son of God can become a curse without suffering disobedience to the law. He enters into our plight. He becomes a human being. He places himself within the present evil age, under the power of sin, under the principalities and powers of the air, in order to defeat them so that we would participate in a life like his. Second point. First point is Jesus represents us on the cross. Let me tell you this. If Jesus is only our representative on the cross, then we don't need to be celebrating Easter because a representative Jesus cannot save. But a Jesus who represents and dies as a substitute and then resurrects from the dead can save. Y'all still with me? When he's someone who enters into our plight, who becomes a human being and who defeats the power of sin and death as a human being, And we need that person to perfectly obey God, to go to the cross, to suffer our our penalty. And then we need that person on the third day to resurrect from the dead so that we would have eternal life as human beings who trust in the God-man who represents us, who substitutes for us, and who resurrects for us from the dead. So my second point, I'm going to talk about substitution for a moment. Let me say a word about the background here. As you all know, this idea of atonement, when I say atonement, I simply mean an act of God to deliver us from our sins. We have this concept of substitution, I think, or at least of sacrifice in the Old Testament. I'm going to look at all these passages, but you see on your outline there four specific points that I make. First, you have these offerings in Leviticus chapters 4 through 7, you have the bloody sin offering, the bloody guilt offering, these offerings that were offered by Jews in the Old Testament, in my view, to symbolically represent that they were confessing their sins before God, and these animals were being sacrificed as an act of confessing their sin before God, and they symbolically, these animals, were, were representing, I think, the Jewish people as they were being sacrificed, and they were at the same time functioning as substitutes for the people because the people did not die, but rather the animals died. And as the hand was placed upon these animals, these animals symbolically were taking on the sins of the people, and the people were purified from their sins, and the places that they defiled were purified. And you have this Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16 where you have these two different rituals, this sacrificial ritual where you have a animal sacrificed, and then you have this scapegoat ritual, where the scapegoat is released into the wilderness to symbolically represent that the animal is taking away the sin of the people. And then you have Isaiah chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet talks about this suffering servant in Isaiah 53, who's going to come and bear the sins of many, which seems to give this idea that there's a messianic-like figure, Isaiah seems to suggest, who's coming at a particular point in history in order to take upon himself the sins of the people. And the sins of the people would not just be the Jewish people, according to Isaiah 40 to 66, but they would also be the sins of Gentiles as well. But there's another background that we want to think about for a moment, a couple others. Number, uh, the second would be this Greco-Roman background where you had this concept of noble or patriotic or heroic death, this idea where human beings are offering themselves up as a sacrifice for the city-state. Anybody with a military family or military background in the room? You know, the military gets this, right? They, they go to serve this country and are willing to lay their lives down for the country. 
so that the citizens of the country would receive certain benefits. So we don't die for the country, but the military does. They're willing to die a patriotic death. And so in one sense, there's a substitution there, right? The whole nation's not perishing, but rather a few people, many people, in fact, have perished for the sake of the freedom of a nation. So you have this idea in the Greco-Roman world as well of a patriotic or a noble death. But then third, this third background leading up to our talk from Romans chapter 5 is also found in what I call the Jewish martyrological traditions. How many of you have heard of the Apocrypha? Very good, a few of you have. The Apocrypha, a collection of Jewish texts that are often called the intertestamental literature that was written in between Malachi and in between the Gospel of Matthew. And these apocryphal texts, Protestants traditionally haven't believed these texts are scripture, but what these apocryphal texts do is, I think, they give us helpful information about the cultural context into which the Christian movement was birthed. You have to remember this. Christianity was not created in a vacuum. It comes from Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. He was not a Christian, right? Right? He was a Jew. The Apostle Paul was a Jew in Judaism. When he gives his life to Jesus, he's a transformed Jew. He forsakes his former manner of life in Judaism as a Christian, but he remains a Jew. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I'm a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, Paul says. So when you read these apocryphal texts, and particularly 2nd and 4th Maccabees, They give us some helpful information about a background in front of which to understand Paul's remarks about substitution. Let me summarize briefly what you find in those texts. You have stories about these Jewish martyrs in these texts who offer themselves up in death against this tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes IV in order to reconcile the nation of Israel to God again, who was separated from God because of her disobedience to the law of God, 2 Maccabees tells us. In 4th Maccabees, you have more explicit language. You have these martyrs who are executed in the narrative because of their faithfulness to a Jewish way of life. And one martyr particularly named Eliezer says this. He prays that God in 4th Maccabees chapter 6, verses 28 and 29 that God would use his blood to be a means by which he purifies the nation. And then you have the author of 4th Maccabees, I have it there on your handout, in chapter 17, verses 21 to 22, saying this about the martyrs' deaths, that their deaths purified the homeland and functioned like a to hilasterio is the Greek phrase. I translate that. This is debated, but I translate that as a propitiatory. Similar to what you find in Romans 3.25 when Paul calls Jesus a propitiation, if you're looking at the English Standard Version translation. So all of that to say, here's my basic point leading up to Romans chapter 5. My talk is about representation and substitution, but these categories are not unique to Paul. I'm on page 2 now. They're not unique to Paul. You have representative and substitutionary categories in Jewish texts. In my view, animals in Leviticus, a messianic figure in Isaiah 53, but explicitly these categories are applied to Jewish people, human beings, in 2 Maccabees and in 4 Maccabees, which takes us now to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to talk about substitution. Let me define it for you. What do I mean by substitution? Everybody still awake? Still with me? What do I mean by substitution? Page 2. By substitution, I mean Jesus died as a functional sinner. Now, hear this carefully. He never committed sin, but he became one of us. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God as something to hold on to. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, 
coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the point of obedience, even obedience to death on a cross. When I say he functioned as a sinner, I mean he lived his life as a real man. And he took upon himself the penalty that sinners deserve. Does that make sense? So let me read it again. Jesus died as a functional sinner to deal with the ontological and the functional effects of the curse upon sinners so that he would actually accomplish for them saving benefits. That's what soteriological means, saving benefits. Let me put it in layman's terms. Jesus did not commit sin, but he represented those who did. And he himself took upon himself their penalty in order to eradicate both the presence and power of sin, but also the effects of sin on their lives so that we by faith would receive eternal life. That's what I mean by substitution. So now I want to dive into Romans 5, verses 6 to 11. But first, let me give you a little bit of context. In my view, Paul wrote his letter to the Romans in order to talk about his gospel. He tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that he's not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But he also tells us that he writes the letter in order to present his gospel to the Romans so that they would help him on his missionary journey to Spain. Just read Romans chapter 15. He has a very practical purpose for writing the letter. He wants the Romans to know him. He had never met them before uh, prior to writing this letter, he, he gets to Rome in Acts chapter 28. He's there at the end of Acts, and he's, he's a prisoner. But he wrote the letter to the Romans before he arrived in Rome. But he wants to go to Rome in order to be helped by the Romans to Spain to take the gospel there. So he spends the bulk of his book, particularly the first 11 chapters, outlining his gospel. And then chapters 12 through 15, he spends time talking about how the gospel is to be lived out in the real world, on the ground with real people. When you get to chapter 5 of Romans, the text I want us to focus on throughout the rest of my lecture, in chapter 5, he begins this new section in the letter known as hope. I think it's all about hope. You read Romans 5, 1 to 11, and you read Romans 8, verses 1 to 39. Those verses are all about hope, what hope defined in different ways. And for Paul, hope is not uncertainty, it's certainty. Hope is not this. I hope the Hoosiers make it into the tournament next year. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I'm a UK fan. I hope the Wildcats win the national championship next year. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But hope for Paul is this. It's certainty, it's confidence, it's absolute confidence grounded in the work of God in Jesus Christ for the salvation of sinners. So then when you read Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, Paul is giving us the reason why we have hope. Romans 5, 1, therefore, y'all still with me? Still with me? Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, because we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And he goes on in verses 2 and following to talk about how in suffering, our faith in God is strengthened and our hope in God is certain because, Romans 5, 6 to 11, Jesus died for our sins. So then, if you look at Romans 5, 6 to 11, he makes this very specific point, particularly verses 6 and 8. I'm on letter C there on page 2, that Jesus died a voluntary death for the ungodly, and he accomplished benefits for them. Verse 6 and verse 8, he says, Christ died for the weak. He does not mean he died for those who are physically weak, but he died for sinners. That's what he means. To be weak in Romans 5 means to be a sinner, and that is everybody, no matter how strong you are. Romans 5, 6, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Romans 5, 8, God shows his own love toward us like this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The weak and the sinners are the same group of people. Namely, Romans 3, 23, everybody without exception. Paul continues and he says in Romans 3, verse 23, I've already mentioned it, that the ungodly sinners are both Jews and Gentiles. You need to feel the weight of that tonight. One of the issues Paul is dealing with in the letter is an ethnic issue. Who are the people of God, he asks in Romans 3, 29 and 30. Is God the God of the Jews only? And if you are not a Jew tonight, you are a Gentile. Everybody who's not Jewish is a Gentile. So here's the question. Is God only the God of Jewish people and everybody else goes to hell? That's the question. And Paul's answer is no, God's the God of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. So everybody without ethnic restriction, geographic restriction, linguistic restriction, gender restriction, everybody without exception is weak and sinful. And Jesus represents those people. And Paul says he's going to also die for them. So notice double C there, page 2. Jesus did not die, Romans 5, 7, a noble death. Now remember this. If you die for a good cause in the ancient world, that's called a noble death. If you die for the, the noble city of Greece, you die for the Roman Empire, or in our context, if you die for your country, for your land to protect its freedom, that is called a noble death, a patriotic death. But Jesus did not die a noble death. He died an ignoble death. He did not die for the strong or for the healthy. He died for the weak and for the sick, right? Can I get a witness tonight, folks? Y'all with me? Noble deaths in the ancient world were deaths for a good cause. Just read the historian Tacitus and read the historian Livy. But Paul says Jesus died for weak and ungodly sinners. That takes us down to verses 9 and 10. Double D there on your outline. Jesus' death for sinners actually provides saving benefits by faith for the guilty for whom Jesus died. Now this is very important for my thesis. Jesus died as a substitute for our sins. What does that mean? Here is the essence of substitution right here. His death for the unrighteous actually achieves saving benefits for those for whom he died, right? You go to the military, you fight in a war, you might or might not win. Your country may or may not get its freedom through your sacrifice. But in the case of Jesus, Paul says that Jesus' substitutionary death actually accomplished saving benefits for those for whom he died. It is certain. And here are three benefits he talks about. Number one, justification. Verse 9. Reconciliation. Verse 10. And salvation. And I want to talk about each of these because each one is very important for what I'm arguing. First, justification. What does it mean to be justified? You think about that. Justification in Paul's theology refers to God's verbal exoneration for the sinner in God's law court. Here's what it means. To be justified is for God to look at you and to say, you are not guilty. And here's why you're not guilty. You're not guilty because Jesus Christ died for your sins. And here's why you're not guilty. Because you have united yourself to Jesus by faith. And in Christ, you are exonerated. Not in yourselves, but in Christ, you are exonerated. You hear the verdict, sinner. You're not guilty. Because Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 9, died for your sins. That's justification. And God, by His grace, 
renders the verdict not guilty because he reckons to your account Jesus' righteousness and you receive on your record, on your account, Jesus' righteousness because he, as your representative and as your substitute, took upon his record your sin. Y'all hear me tonight? That's substitution. And that's justification. I have a variety of verses there. Let me give you one, Romans 5, verse 9. Much more now having been justified. How are you justified? You're justified by His blood. Here's another way of saying it. Paul, how am I justified? Jarvis, you're justified by His death for your sins. Second. Paul talks about reconciliation. Second point, page three. Reconciliation refers to the friendship that exists between God and sinners as a result of justification by faith in Christ. This friendship between God and the sinner is achieved by faith in Christ because of Jesus' death for the ungodly. And this friendship will serve as a means by which the reconciled friend will be delivered from God's future wrath in the day of judgment. Hear this. This is not popular today. This is not popular amongst New Testament scholars. There is a wrath of God that is coming upon the world. God will, at the end of the ages, pour out His divine wrath upon everybody who doesn't love Jesus Christ. Just read Revelation. And Paul is making this point. You, in fact, are, outside of faith in Jesus, you are an enemy of God. But in Christ Jesus, you are God's friend. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, hear what Paul says. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God. How were you reconciled to God? Hear it. You were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Do you you feel my definition a little bit more? Even if you disagree with what I'm saying, do you feel what I'm arguing a little bit more now? The means by which we are justified and the means by which we are reconciled is through a substitutionary death that actually gives benefits to those for whom the death was offered. Reconciled. Friends with God. Third benefit Paul talks about. These aren't exhaustive, by the way. But here's the third benefit in this text. He talks about salvation. Now, in my view, (coughs) in New Testament scholarship, it's like anything else. It's very complex and complicated. Every discipline is complicated. Every one of them. Your majors, whatever they are, you know that in your individual major, every major has a language of its own, and people within that major that disagrees about things, right? Nobody agrees on everything, generally speaking, in our particular disciplines. And it's also true in New Testament scholarship. I'm going to define, however, the concept of salvation this way. It's a a concept that broadly speaks about participating in eternal life that begins now in this age and in the age to come by faith in Jesus. But the word that Paul uses here, the particular Greek verb that he uses here, it's the Greek verb sozo. It can be translated to mean to be to heal or to be healed, but it's a verb that can also refer to deliverance. Here's what he is here's the point that he's making in this category. Because Jesus died for our sins, Romans 5 8, we'll be justified, we'll be reconciled, but watch this. We will, and here's the hope, it's certain, we will be delivered from God's wrath. Hear that. We will be delivered from God's wrath. You go to war and fight in a battle, you might not be delivered from the judgment of the enemy. You might not be delivered if you get sick from your sickness. But hear this, because Jesus died for our sins, we will be saved. That is, we will be delivered from God's wrath. What wrath? The wrath that God is going to pour out on the world when Jesus comes from heaven to earth to make all the wrongs right. We will be delivered. 
We often say, I got saved when I was 10. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. But you need to understand something. What happened to you when you were 10 guarantees you will be saved when Jesus returns. Notice what Paul says in chapter 5 here at verse 10. I'll give you a quick summary and some applications. And you can pepper me with hard questions. Verse 10, he says, or excuse me, verse 9, Much more then, having now been, here it is again, justified by his blood. That's just a, a reference to his death. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, to be fair, in the Greek text, the phrase of God is not there. The phrase of God is in your English Bibles and it's italicized. In the Greek text, of God is not there. But the translators of the Greek text are making a translational decision because they are rightly, I think, interpreting the wrath from which we will be uh, delivered and from which we will be saved is God's wrath. Because Paul has already said in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 that God is going to pour out wrath upon this world. So the translators are simply saying the wrath of God from which those who have been justified by the blood of Christ will be delivered is God's very own wrath. And there's no wrath like God's wrath. There's no love like God's love, folks. But there's no wrath like God's wrath. And here's what Paul is saying. In the cross of Jesus Christ, the love of God, Romans 5 eight, and the wrath of God, they kiss each other and they reach down from heaven and deliver everybody from God's judgment who believes in Christ by faith. You say, who cares? Well, you should. Page four. You can read that summary on your own. I'm at 34 minutes. I'm going to try to bring this thing to a close in a few minutes here so you can ask me questions. I really want some dialogue here. But I want to say something about the resurrection because Easter's coming, right? 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not going to read that passage. But just know this, a dead Jesus doesn't save anybody. A Jesus who is merely a representative or merely an example will not save anybody. Socrates is a great example. There are all sorts of great examples. Sometimes I dream, remember that song? That he is me, like Mike. You know who Michael Jordan is, right? If I can be like Mike, he's a great example in terms of basketball, right? But he's not going to save anybody, right? I answer my own question, right. There are all kinds of great examples. What saves you, hear this, is God himself invading this world in real human flesh. And taking upon himself your plight and then going to the cross as your substitute and then resurrecting, hear this, resurrecting from the dead to show he has crushed the power of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And by faith in that Christ, and faith is active, by giving your life to that Christ, you too taste everything for which he died, namely eternal life. You read 1 Corinthians 15, and just look at the things I've given you here. Paul says, as I've said, a dead Jesus doesn't save anybody, but praise God, Easter's coming. He has been risen from the dead. So I have 11 applications, all right? 11. I'm at 36 minutes here. I'm going to hit these quickly. First, let me say something about the wrath of God. The theological word that we use when we talk about God's wrath being satisfied is the word propitiation. If you read Romans 3.25 in the New American Standard Translation or in the English Standard Translation, it, says, it translates this Greek term, hilasterion, as propitiation. There's a massive debate about whether or not it's right to translate that word that way, but the ESV takes it as propitiation and the NASB takes it as propitiation. And propitiation means that God's wrath was satisfied. So if you have a professor who's mad at you because you haven't done good work, the way you satisfy his anger, this is only analogy, right? All analogies break down. The way you satisfy his anger is do good work. 
To a greater degree, God's wrath, His judgment, was satisfied in the cross of Jesus. Now hear this carefully. By this, we don't mean that God's wrath is like a human's wrath. God is wrathful and loving and just and holy and patient at the same time. Theologians call that the constancy of God. God is constant. He's never conflicted in His emotions. He can love while hating. He can love the Son while, while crushing Him with His judgment on behalf of sinners. Does that make sense? He can, John 3, 16, He can love the world and He can love the Son while He's crucifying His Son for the salvation of sinners. God can do both at the same time and neither one of His attributes, His justice and His love, neither one of those is conflicted with each other or contradict each other. We can't do that. I can't be loving and angry usually at the same time. Propitiation. God's wrath is satisfied. Second, because of Jesus' substitutionary death, our sins are expiated. That word there, expiation, means God actually deals with our sin problem. I hope that frees you tonight. That in the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, God has dealt with your sin problem. Oh yeah, we still fight against sin, don't we? Y'all know y'all fight against some sin. And y'all know y'all got some struggles tonight. We all have struggles. But here's the point that I'm making. That because I am in Christ, God doesn't count my sin against me because He's satisfied it in Jesus and He's wiped it away through the blood and the resurrection. Does that make sense? Now hear this carefully. I want you to hear this carefully. That doesn't mean, therefore, we can live any way we want. We are free to be a slave of love toward God and toward one another. We're not free to live any way we want. We're free to love God. But the point I'm making is this, is that when the devil, if you're trusting Jesus tonight, and when the devil tempts you to despair and he reminds you of your guilt within, you remind him that Jesus satisfied God's wrath against your sin and he wiped those sins away. And no matter what accusations the devil brings before you, and he will, your sins in Christ are forgiven if you have faith. And faith is active. Faith does not mean I believe intellectually only. It means your life is surrendered to Jesus. Third, justification. Because of Jesus' death for our sins, when, if we have faith in Christ, when we stand before God, we'll hear the verdict, not guilty. And guess what? That verdict has already entered this world now. I'm not waiting to find out if I'm saved. I am saved right now if I'm trusting in Jesus because I have the Holy Spirit if I'm trusting in Jesus. And God's future verdict that he will announce on the last day, on the day of judgment, has entered in to this world right now, and it says you're not guilty in Christ. So for those of y'all who are struggling with your assurance tonight, if you love Jesus and if you're following him, stop struggling with your assurance. You follow me? Because what God has done for you in Christ, if you're following Jesus, if you're giving your life to Him, what He's done for you in Jesus guarantees that you will hear God's verdict of not guilty on the last day, and that verdict has disrupted this present evil age right now, and it has shut up the devil and his lies. Oh, he's going to talk, but his words should fall on deaf ears if you're resting in Christ. I'm going to write a book someday, hopefully, called I Hate the Devil and the Devil Hates Me. He hates you too. But in Christ, you're justified. Fourth, you're reconciled. You're friends with God in Christ. Some of you all struggle with loneliness on this campus. Some of you maybe came to a Christian school thinking you're going to have all kinds of friends because you're going to a Christian school. I went to a Christian college, a seminary. You can be very lonely at a Christian school. But hear this, God is your friend if you are in Christ. You might not feel it. You might not taste it. But the reality of God being your friend is rooted in what he's done for you in Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. Five. Jesus has brought salvation to those of us who believe because of his death 
on the cross. Now I'm at 42 minutes, so I'm just going to shut this thing, this thing down now. I'm going to say one more thing here. Let me say a word about social reconciliation, then we'll bring it to a close. See, in my work, I actually think what I've said about the cross connects to the modern-day racial division that we have. A Jewish Messiah absorbed the wrath of God on the cross and resurrected from the dead for red and yellow, black and white, rich and poor, abled and disabled, male and female, English-speaking, non-English-speaking, international and domestic people. To create those people by his cross into one new humanity filled with different kinds of humanities. Does that make sense? The cross of Jesus Christ is a multi-ethnic atonement, an atonement for all people who believe. And because he absorbed God's wrath, representing us as a real Jewish man, and took upon himself our sin, therefore, the gospel has something to say about how racism should be eradicated in the Christian community. Amen. Jesus, bless our time now as we talk. Amen. All right, here we go. I'm done. I mean, you ask me questions now. I know that was an awkward way to end. So I'm at 44 minutes. I think we're done at what? 50? <laughs> Sorry. We'll be, we'll be done around 9, 10 o'clock. It's fine. The, yeah, we can stay here all yeah. night if you want. Yeah. I've already pulled no one whining. No whining. No uh, whining. So there's a ton there. Uh, any questions? I know sometimes, it, it, you know, for me, for you, it might take a minute or two to think through uh, what was said, what was controversial, what wasn't. Um, but any, any questions? I'm... You can disagree, too. Yeah, yeah. We'll see if I can word this in a good way. <clears throat> so how would you advise witnessing to people without making it like we're just trying to scare them yep. into heaven? Because I feel like there's a divide between, like, Jesus is the good guy and God's just the wrathful one. So how do we make it, like, I know they're the same person or the same entity, so how do we explain that to people? Yep, it's a good question. question is, how do you share the gospel with people without scaring them with what I just articulated? I think um, your evangelistic posture, in part, is determined by the context into which you're speaking. So it depends on your context. So if you're talking to someone who has a fairly decent understanding of the Bible, but they're not a believer, then they're already familiar with some of these categories of sin and judgment and wrath. And I think, quite frankly, there are people who grow up in Christian homes, and all they hear about is God's wrath, and they hate God. And so you don't want, I don't, I don't think, you don't want to be these angry Christians who go around all the time telling people they're going to hell without giving them any grace that tells them how they can be saved from that judgment. Now, hear me carefully, I do believe in a real hell and a real judgment that is coming. But what I'm saying to you is, is that you can't know the good news unless you know the bad news. And so I want people to understand that we're all sinners. When I talk to unbelievers, that we're all sinners and that Jesus has provided the solution to our problem of sin by his death and resurrection. I'll give you one quick example. I was speaking, and this doesn't always happen, but I was speaking in, in Indiana, in Indianapolis, uh, a few weeks ago at a conference, and there was a young lady who came up to me afterwards, and she says, uh, Dr. Williams, I'm not a Christian. I want to be a Christian, but I'm not ready. What should I do? And I said, uh, well, First of all, praise God, you're asking me this question. And so I lovingly spoke to her and explained to her the hope of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. I included me, uh, myself, within the problem. That I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, and that Jesus died to deliver us from our sin and from the judgment that's come because of it. So to answer your question, I would say, is that we want to help people understand that there is a problem, but there's also a solution. But we want to do that in love. And see, evangelism, I love evangelism. I don't think there's one way to do evangelism. When I say evangelism, I just simply mean sharing your faith. See, I think most of the time, the Apostle Paul spent, um, let me just say it this way, a lot of the times he spent evangelizing over meals and over conversations in the ordinary areas of life. 
as he's working on some tents. Right? Talking about Jesus. As he's chained to a Roman soldier. Paul, why are you locked up? Well, there's this Jewish man named Jesus. He's died, he resurrected from the dead. And I've been preaching this Jesus, and he can save you from your sins. I mean, Paul seems to appropriate his evangelistic strategy depending upon his context. So one of the things you need to do in terms of sharing your faith, y'all like my little dance here? One, one, one of the things you want to do as you're sharing your faith is look at your surroundings and ask yourself, what can these people identify with? And try to use gospel language and real-world language to apply those gospel concepts so they can understand what God has done for them in Christ. And also, you need to recognize that evangelism is not a one-time shotgun approach. That does work. You know, passing out tracts is great. Door-to-door stuff. I grew up in a Bible Belt area in Eastern Kentucky. I did some door-to-door stuff. Uh, frankly, I don't think that's the most effective way to do it, right? I don't want to be bothered, so why do I think other people want to be bothered? And I'm a Christian, right? I don't want to be bothered with people coming by my house randomly. Uh, so I think one of the things we have to do when we evangelize is, is realize we've got to build relationships with folks so they can see our faith as we share our faith. I'm more convinced as a 40-year-old man that we just spend time trying to get to know folk and their story. And then lean in to their story with gospel hope. Does that make sense? Have one sister tell me, look, quite frankly, I just don't trust you until I get to know you in terms of what you're saying about theology and the gospel. That's true, right? Uh, You need to articulate truth in a way that is loving and authentic. And I'm afraid that a lot of unbelievers, they don't believe our message because our lives aren't consistent with the message, and we don't care about them as people. Now, let me just be clear here. I believe God saves in spite of our hypocrisy. God does not ask us to be saved. He disrupts our life and changes it. He causes us to come to faith, in my understanding of salvation. But he uses means, and a means by which people come to faith is evangelism. And a means by which evangelism can be effective is by lovingly building relationships with people and sharing your faith as you show your faith. And not, or shape your Bible at people. I don't think that convinces anybody. Yes. Yes. Yeah, good question. The question re- relates to the apocryphal books that I refer to, 2nd Maccabees, 4th Maccabees. The question is, should we treat those as Scripture? I'm a Protestant, so I say no. Uh, as, a pro- as a Protestant, I think the Bible is what we have here, what's canonized, six, six books of the Bible. Uh, the, the, the apocryphal text, and then you have another collection of writings known as the Pseudepigrapha, and then you have another collection known as Josephus and uh, Philo and uh, then the Dead Sea Scrolls. In my view, these texts give us a picture of early Judaism in the Second Temple period. It helps us to fit early Christianity into its larger cultural context. And and so for me, those texts don't read as as Scripture to me. They give me historical context. It's interesting, however, when you look at uh, the book of Jude, Jude cites 1 Enoch. 1-9, 1-9, which is a pseudepigraphic text. And he also cites, you know that story in, in Jude where Jude talks about the devil and Michael the archangel fighting over the body of Moses? That's not in the Old Testament. That's from this pseudepigraphic work that has been lost called the Assumption of Moses. So, so, so again, what's going on there? I don't think Jude believes those texts are Scripture, but he does see those as part of his cultural context, you see. So when I read uh, what we call non-canonical, the canon would be, again, the Old Testament the New Testament in the Christian tradition, non-canonical texts, they help me understand the cultural context. Because you have to remember this, we all have baggage and presuppositions about the Bible. Everybody does. We all bring stuff to the text, and that can be good or bad, depending on what you're bringing to it, right? And so what we've got to try really hard to do is to try to become more like uh, the ancients who received these texts um, and think in ways that are more consistent with the way in which they would have fought. Now, the fact is, that's difficult because even when we read these ancient texts, we're still Western thinkers, right? But my point is, is that reading those texts, if, here, let me say this way. if I want to know what Jewish people believed in the Second Temple period, I don't read a 21st century commentary. 
I read Josephus, I read Philo, I read the Apocrypha, I read the Pseudepigrapha, I read the Dead Sea Scrolls. Does that make sense? Yeah. How would you personally use the evidence of new Christianity if their lives show no evidence of spiritual fruit? Yeah, how would I reach people who claim to be Christians but their lives don't show spiritual fruit? Again, I think similar to the question about evangelism, it depends on the posture of the person. Let's just say, for example, um, every Christian struggles with something. There's nobody in here who's perfect. And uh, sanctification is a process. So I think I'm saved, but I know that I have issues. I know I, I'm impatient, and a fruit of the Spirit is patience. But I'm impatient. So here's, here's, the, here's the question. Am I, is this my posture? Is my posture, I'm impatient and I don't care. I can do whatever I want. Is that my posture? If that's my posture, I need to hear a warning. If you don't walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.21, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if the posture is, Jesus, I'm struggling with patience. Help me. And I tell other brothers in Christ, I'm struggling with patience. Pray for me. Hold me accountable. Their posture toward me should be different. It shouldn't be, well, you're not going to hear the kingdom of God. It should be, uh, we'll pray for you, brother, and rest in Christ. Does that, does that make sense? So people who are living a rebellious life against the gospel, on the one hand, and then claim the Christian hope, need to hear warnings. To be a Christian is more than praying. Hey, look, in my view, I don't, I don't think be, being a Christian means you ask Jesus to come into your heart. It means you give up your life and follow him until you die. You take up your cross and follow him. And that's going to be a process. And that's going to look differently in different contexts. Um, but if you have people who say, I love Jesus, but I hate my neighbor, I'm going to say, maybe you don't love Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's quoted in the New Testament too. So it depends on the posture. So hear this carefully. Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall by no means fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. You walk in the Spirit. Jesus died to deliver us from the present evil age, and he gave us the Spirit. Galatians 3, Galatians 14, uh, 3, 14. 3, 13 and 14. Romans uh, 5, Romans 8. Evidence of the Spirit is obedience. Not perfect, but imperfect obedience is better than no obedience, right? Right? So that's how we respond. So we all have people that we perhaps associate with in churches who think they're believers and they're not. But here's what I want to do. I want to pull the log out my own eye before I start worrying about everybody else's salvation. See, I think one of the problems with Christians is we're too busy worried about those people out there and we're not looking in the mirror and pointing the finger this way. You follow me? So before I give a verdict on your soul, I want to, first of all, find out, am I saved? <laughs> I have too much trouble figuring that question out sometimes. You follow me? I'm just being real tonight. I believe I am saved, but sometimes I don't feel saved. That's part of the Christian life, too. Because being saved is not a feeling. It's a reality in Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah, the question, let me paraphrase the question. The question relates to uh, how, how do I, th what is the reason I would give regarding the world's posture toward Christians? Um, is, it, is it because we have enemies of the world or is it because there are a lot of Christians who are hypocritical? I would say yes. <laughs> yeah, so we've got to always remember that people are going to hate Christianity because of Christians, who, people who claim to be Christians and not because of the Christ of Christianity. Um, and people are going to hate Christianity because they are lost, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so, again, what I want to do in my own Christian experience is, is just ask the Lord to help me be faithful in the ordinary areas of my life in the spaces in which he places me and not try to figure out all the reasons why this is happening here or there, but be faithful in my own space, in my own location, and trust that the gospel will bring friendship with God, but enemies of the world. And you have to be content with that. 
Not everybody's going to love you. In fact, the warning is, if you're a Christian, most people won't. <laughs> and, those of, and those brothers and sisters who are in other countries know that better than we know it in this country that has laws that protect us because we're saved. You follow what I'm saying? We have religious liberties here in this country and praise God for them. But there are brothers and sisters who are kidnapped and who are terrorized in other countries that have no uh, protection from the government at all and they feel the weight of the world will hate you, as Jesus says. And, 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 they'll, hate, and they'll hate us because of hypocrisy, yes, but also because of depravity, sin. You could be the most righteous Christian on the planet and there will be people who will still hate you because you love Jesus. Doesn't mean everybody will, but I mean, you're not going to be friends with everybody. But you should strive toward living with peace with all men and, so far, and women insofar as it's possible, right? Love your neighbor, but lock the door at night, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, but lock the door at night, right? You have to be wise. You're welcome. Other questions? Any questions about the lecture? <laughs> I worked hard on that lecture. Any questions about the lecture? We have time for maybe maybe two more. Let's see how this goes. Okay. Braxton, is, is, was that your hand? Yeah. Yell it. All right. Um, it doesn't fly. I'm sorry. That's only five of them. <laughs> it doesn't fly. That's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> you mentioned about like, Christianity being like anti-racism. How do you like, rectify the idea of racism historically and in Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good question. The question is, uh, I made this statement. I'm going to state it the way you stated it, but then I'm going to nuance what I intended to say a little bit um, earlier. So the question is, uh, first of all, a statement he said that I said that Christianity provides a solution to racism. Uh, I, want to, I, don't, I don't know if I said it just like that, uh, but I'm saying what you said. And then he followed up with this question, how can I say that in light of the historical fact that Christianity in this country perpetuated and created the whole culture of racism. So here, here's what I intended to communicate was that I think the gospel is the, is the fundamental solution to the racial, racial divide, the gospel of Jesus. Now, when I say gospel, okay, understand I believe in a big gospel, not this little truncated one floating around out here in some of these circles that care nothing about loving your neighbor stuff. So I think the gospel, I don't have time to tease this out, but I think the gospel is fundamentally it means an announcement that God has fulfilled all of his saving promises for the world in his son, Jesus Christ. And there are three aspects to that announcement. One, vertical, how you get right with God. Two, horizontal, how we can be reconciled with each other. And then thirdly, cosmological, God is about the business of restoring the entire creation. What Adam lost in the garden, Jesus' cross and resurrection work to restore that. That's why you get this language of new creation in Isaiah 65. You get it repeated in, in, in Galatians 6 verse 15. So, so I would say that the gospel is the solution. Now the problem is, is that Christians have been the problem to racism in this country historically in many respects. But part of what we need is a recovery of what the gospel is and how it should be applied in order to rectify the racial divide. Now, the reality is as well, see, I believe the gospel is, provides us the answer, but we got to do the hard work of analyzing the culture and, and analyzing systems and structures and knowing what those structures and systems are and knowing how they were put in place. And we got to do the hard work of, dare I say it, we got to do the hard wor work of sociological analysis. Not because it provides any life-changing answers, but, but, but it does diagnose the problem at a at a cultural level to help us understand how sin has not only affected individuals but also systems. The Bible tells me that, and the Bible tells me Jesus doesn't just want your life. He wants that, but he wants everything else too. He wants all systems and authorities and nations. Every knee shall bow, every earthly power, every demonic power. He wants it all. He came to take it all back. And when you understand the gospel like that, maybe... Just maybe we'll get a step closer toward this one new man in Jesus now in anticipation of the age to come. So that's what I would say. And I also say, read my book, One New Man, <laughs> The Cross and Racial Reconciliation in Paul's Theology. And I'd also say, read my book, um, 
a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a biblical theology of ethnic identity coming out hopefully before I die. <laughs> it's got to get written first. Uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not saying, hear this, I'm not saying just preach the gospel. That's usually code for I don't care about human suffering. I'm saying preach the gospel, live the gospel, love the gospel, apply the gospel on the ground with real people and try to understand the culture into which you're living it and into which you're speaking it so that you'll know what the problem is as it relates to the race issue. And that's a lifelong pursuit. Okay, that is a perfect place. We got, <laughs> he's got books, buy the books. It's a great place to end. Let's thank our speaker.